I want to go to the life of Paul and, and Timothy. So if you return in your Bibles to 2 Timothy, just one verse, chapter 1, verse 5. They had a very, very close relationship together, and he is longing to see Timothy to be filled with joy. And then he says this, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded uh, now lives in you also. You know, I've been here for 18 years. You guys have been putting up with my sermons for 18 years. <laughs> and over the years as I've aged, you know, you've seen the uh, illustrations change. So now I'm in the stage of grandchildren illustrations. We have two, Johnny and Mackie. Johnny's three, Mackie is one. Uh, he gets the name Mac because his middle name is Mackenzie. Instead of Mac, he's little, they call him Mackie. So anyway... Every morning when I enter the office, there's a picture of Johnny taped on my wall and a picture of Mackie, and I pray for the two of them. And hopefully, about an hour later, we might be able to do a little FaceTime, and I can actually see them and talk to them. It makes me pray, and it's the same prayer every morning. God, save my grandchildren and keep them close to you. For Alice and I... These two are third-generation Christians. For Ben's family, they are fourth-generation. It was his grandfather who first came to Christ, and salvation has run through that uh, home. And one, therefore, can get maybe a little too used to being Christian. One could think that maybe salvation and so forth is, is automatic and that everything is just going to turn out. So I pray God help them to appreciate their family line and choose them. Alice and I are first-generation Christians. She, apart from her family, um, found Christ at a summer camp, saved up her money, and went to summer camp and found Christ there. And though my father and I became Christians relatively close together, I would have to say that both of us are first-generation Christians. Our kids are second, and we knew their experience would be different, and now we have a third generation. And each generation has its own way, if you will, of embracing the faith. Um, and, you know, let's face it, sometimes, you know, you see a third, fourth generation out there and it doesn't go so well. So we're brought to our knees and we're praying always. Salvation, you see, is a miracle-working act of God. So I pray for their owning the faith. It's a funny thing because I have not prayed that they would turn out beautiful, though they are, and they're brilliant as well. Um, now, I haven't done that. It hasn't even crossed my mind or that they would uh, excel in life or be successful um, because, well, maybe they're little, but I think it's more, well, if a person comes to Christ and makes Christ first, aren't all these other things going to fall into place, you know? So salvation is the most important thing. If they find Christ and they walk with him, then God will be their guide. Godliness is profitable for all things, says the Apostle Paul, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. 1 Timothy 4, verse 8. So passing our faith on from one generation to the next has to be the most important thing we can do. In this passage, we have three generations of Christians. Though Eunice and Lois may have uh, found Christ at the same time, we have grandma, mother, and son. And certainly I want to talk about passing on the faith in our homes, but I want to blend it with the place of the church also in our homes. So first, let's just say something to parents who have to go it alone. If I had to rewrite this sermon, but you go to press every Wednesday and it doesn't change, so the outline's in print, I would have probably just said, even in the absence of a spouse's faith. Um, but here, it, you know, it, it's uh, really a father's faith, because in Acts 16, we read that Timothy's mother, Eunice, was a Jewish uh, woman who believed in Christ. His father was Greek and uh, most likely unbelieving. Uh, only Eunice's faith is mentioned. So she alone, along with her church, I believe, 
taught Timothy the scriptures and the matters of faith, but this could go for a husband or whatever who is going it alone. She alone taught Timothy scriptures and the matters of faith. And Timothy turned out a very fine Christian man who worked with the Apostle Paul and then later became a pastor of a church. Now, as I will say in the next point, that the Father's presence is extremely important. I'm not undermining that, but there's, let's face it, there are situations in life where that is not going to happen. Just not going to happen. Uh, dear lady that we knew up north, she was only 20-something. She had two sons. Her husband went off to work and was killed at work. Can you imagine being a 20-something mother with two little boys? Uh, and she was left to raise them on her own. They turned out. They're good men. Okay? Later, she did uh, marry a, another person and had two children by him, too. But there for a while, she went it alone. Alice has a good friend who's out east, married to a pastor out there. He was raised by his mother alone. And yes, there are those who are left behind because of divorce. Um, and it's not to mention, you know, some within the home who are just struggling because maybe the other half just doesn't quite get it. But in all these circumstances, God is not bound to statistics and so forth out there. There is grace to meet these special needs. There is hope for all who have to go it alone. Remember, Mary Siegfried in our church in upstate New York had three children, and she raised them in the Lord. You know, her husband was there, but he didn't believe. He came to Christ, oh, probably about the time the youngest was in uh, junior, senior year of high school. So pretty much it was her influence. All three walk with the Lord to this day. We got caught up. We found out they have a son daughter-in-law in Wisconsin, and so we rendezvoused in Milwaukee and had pizza together and shared old stories and what has been going on. So, God is bigger than what is. But let's talk about mom and dad together, working together to pass the faith on. We have heard it said that the husband is the head of the home. How many have heard that? Yeah, you've heard it. Uh, in fact, <laughs> In one illustration, some of you are going to know who I'm talking about, but I won't mention his name. But, <laughs> but he would draw this umbrella, and it was a nice symbol, and the father and the husband was the umbrella, and underneath comes wife and the children and so forth. And it, only, it, it really depended on how good that umbrella was. If it was shot full of holes, well, then the devil had many ways of getting through to the, the people below, that he was kind of the ringleader of all things, and all things depended on him. Sorry, though the father has a responsibility, Scripture doesn't say that the husband is the head of the home. It says, go read it, Ephesians 5, that the husband is the head of his wife. What does that mean? Well, I've changed my mind over the years. <laughs> And you'll probably like it, especially if you're a woman. Um, but, you know, some would say that the word head or kephala uh, means authority or chieftain. Uh, and others would say, but it also uh, means uh, source or source of like, sort of the headwaters of the Wisconsin River, which is Lake Vudazir and so forth. Um, and I've taken it to mean the latter, that the husband is a source of life for the wife. You read the context where Christ lays down his life for him, that he did this in order to make the church radiant. That is, the husband, therefore, lays his life down for his wife in order to make her radiant, to be all that she can possibly be. Now, you think about that. If a husband treats his wife that way, there's an illustration in the home for all the children to see of what God's love is all about. It's also indicative of how that father will most likely raise his own children. Scripture tells us that mom and dad are in it together. Ephesians 6, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Proverbs 1.8, where we're told to listen to 
the father's teaching and the mother's teaching. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They were in it together. Listen to your father's teaching presently and with regard to the mother, when you grow old and you're out there somewhere in the future, don't disregard what she taught you. In Scripture, you find the two, mother and father, working together. And this is a little dangerous to say, but I'm just going to say it anyway. Without hierarchy. Without hierarchy. I just see mom and dad together as a team. So in this sense, there is no room for slackers. Children need the influence of both to learn of all the matters of faith. Let's talk about the content and the conviction. What is a sincere faith that Paul is talking about? Well, if you turn to chapter 3, verse 15, we get a little bit of an idea. We'll look at it again uh, when we come to uh, another point. But he talks of how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. I guess if we were to summarize it, it would be a knowledge of the Scriptures and a hearty faith in Jesus Christ. And it's done in partnership with the church. Here's where I want to blend the church in because the home is a part of the church and the church is a part of the home. But some don't quite get that. I've known some very over bearing fathers and husbands who take it all upon themselves. In fact, they probably criticize the church and figure they're not doing it well enough, so I've got to do it. And I've not watched something, and I've only got a few examples that I've seen, but things haven't always turned out very well because of that. We need each other. See, before people had Bibles in their homes, they relied upon the church, those who have been gifted as pastors slash teachers. In fact, Bibles didn't enter homes until Reformation time. That's a lot of years. That's a lot of years. And so if you were in the early church, you didn't have a Bible in your home. You went to church. And you learned the Bible stories, and you would hear the reading of the epistles, and you would sometimes put them to memory, or just at least learn from the Apostle Paul as these letters and Peter and so forth were scattered about. The church is a partner of the home. Even if we have 10 Bibles, you know, all different versions and applications and so forth in your columns, we still need to learn from those who have been taught and gifted. And at the same time, at the same time, we need to be responsible in our homes. You know, we need to be there for our kids. There are many situations that we are called upon by our children. Our children will have questions. And if we don't have the answers, well, we know where we can go to get the answer. Now, my generation would go to somebody and say, hey, my kid just asked me this question. What do you think? The younger generation would you know, go on YouTube or Google, you know, that, that's just an automatic. I was talking to my, my son, and everything he needs to be instructed in, he goes to YouTube. He never asks anybody any. Is that the way you guys do it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how to wax my car. Google it, you know. Anyway. But we know where to go to get the answers, to be there for our children. Um... There are aids for families. There is scripture put to music. I remember our road trips, and I remember every word of every cassette. That was a long time ago. We sing Bible songs and so forth. Yeah, we didn't just do Bible songs. We did all kinds of music. But boy, they played over and over and over and over until you got out to Montana or wherever we were going. There is a sharing of our life stories. There are the spontaneous, teachable moments. And there is the forever role modeling. But, you know, knowledge isn't good enough. There needs to be a deep-seated conviction also. Uh, there always comes a point, no matter how well a child has been raised, where he or she has to own Jesus. And that's different for every individual. Every child is on a journey with God, God in them, bringing them to that point. And that is a supernatural thing. The Puritans used to take children into the church, and they were called covenant members. 
And then when they grew older and could confess Christ as Lord and Savior, they became communing members. And when they became communing members, they actually used the word owning the covenant. Okay? Owning the covenant, making it one's own, or simply owning Christ. And that's a supernatural thing. You know, only God can do it. Um, and it's through prayer on the part of the parents that's going to make that happen. As I said, each child has his or her time. There isn't a prescribed time, you know. You start looking for it when they're juniors and seniors in high school. It could be farther out. Who knows? It's not something we can cause. We can't make a kid love Christ. We can't manufacture it. Personal faith can't be conditioned. All you can do is pray. I was surprised when Tim Kimmel said that he and Darcy, his wife, chose not to lead their children to Christ, that is, to lead them into the sinner's prayer and, 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 and so forth. And I did that with Allison. I mean, she was five. You know, I, I thought that was my job. Uh, the other two uh, didn't come to Christ through one of us. It's just through hearing it and, and uh, so forth. But they deliberately didn't do that. And he said, why? He said, because your children love you and they want to please you. And they'll do whatever they have to to do that. I thought, oh, wow. He wanted his kids to own Christ for real, not something that they pushed, he pushed on them. So we pray, and we pray from the get-go. S. Lewis Johnson told my mentor, John Hanna, to pray over his children every night and to make sure to tell them that Jesus loves them. <laughs> so I put that down in my little notebook and said, okay, I guess that's what I have to do. Let's talk about one last thing, sincerity. Timothy, it says, had a sincere faith, but his mother had it first. So literally, it means without hypocrisy. Our children will look to us and hopefully one day say, Jesus is real to them. They have a faith without hypocrisy. It doesn't mean that we will not have our shortcomings. Oh, my. Sin is everywhere, even in the best Christian homes even in pastors' homes. There is no perfect family. But, you know, you look through all the gook, there is still a viable faith that is truly sincere. There can be a viable faith that is truly sincere. There is a quality of life, if you will, that says Jesus is real. Not just by living by the rules. That's not enough. In fact, Anybody can do that. It's not just by living out the rules. It's by living out grace and love. Grace and love has to fill the home. It doesn't hurt every once in a while as a parent to say, okay, am I getting too caught up in other things? You know, is there one single message here that I am sending? If not, then get, let's get back on track. The only way children get grace and love is to experience it with us. So when all is said and done, more than all the ball games, the concerts, school plays, homecoming court, Allison was homecoming queen, still remember her riding on the back of a vet, academics, Success, ownership of Christ comes first. Loving Jesus is the most important thing. And if they have that, God will guide them through all the rest. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for the reminder. And maybe for some goals that we have to set as you uh, make us um, uh, parents and so forth. Your word is rich. It will not return void. And have your way by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen.